Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I've never had the uh, uh, privilege of speaking with uh, Noam Chomsky on the same platform as, as I recall. He has a better memory than I do, so I might have forgotten something. But I, I remember uh, as a young man uh, questing to understand more about the uh, intellectual failures of our policy, I went to his house, uh, which may be his, still his same house, I don't know. It was about 1967, and he was typing in a bedroom. Uh, I believe he, I don't know anybody else who has done this. You, the, you don't know what a typewriter is probably, but it's, it's, a, it's a similar thing to a computer, and it's on the bed, and he's on a chair to take care of his back, and he's typing, and I think he was typing his uh, famous, notorious, uh, uh, epical article on the failure of the intellectuals in uh, Vietnam in 1967. It's been that long. I have seen him here and there since, but uh, that was our first conversation. And I have to tell you, uh, uh, be because he's uh, sort of a homeboy here in this neighborhood, uh, you may take him for granted, but he is also a global treasure and a witness to suffering and the morbidity of much of uh, our world. So I want to thank him for coming and making that introduction. Uh, I, it, it, it's, it's probably my nature. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly gloomy as an Irish American. I believe in the absurd nature of reality. Uh, uh, but uh, but um, uh, something in me is instinctually oriented to fighting the good fight against the bullies. It, it could be that primitive, that basic. Uh, and and uh, I, I want to compliment uh, Noam's lecture or, or introduction, introduction his, his overview, by um, saying something more um, about the nature of the fight, past, present, and future, uh, because I'm, I'm a combative person. Uh, I am also a historian of social movements. I try to keep my distance and understand what's going on. Uh, sometimes it gets mixed up. A few years ago, I took some MIT students with me and Harvard students to Miami to the uh, Free Trade Zone of the Americas meeting, which was supposed to make uh, Miami the center of uh, corporate globalization for the hemisphere. And I told my students that they, they were to participate in the confrontation in the streets as observers. And I wanted them to interview at least 100 people in the course of the week so we could do what we didn't achieve in the early 1960s, which was on the spot uh, uh, interviews of people taking direct action around uh, a cause. So they did that. And in the course of the uh, several days they were there, none of them had any uh, prior background. I think one uh, of the Harvard students had some background in activism, but, but most of them got arrested uh, uh, while, while backing up from the Miami-Dade police saying something, shouting some slogan like, we are retreating, uh, 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 which didn't do any good. They were then thrown on the ground pepper sprayed in the eyes with the eyes held open. And it, it was quite bizarre because then their parents began to get word as they called for bail. And, and I was up all night wondering what to do. And the IOP over at Harvard was getting calls from above saying, what the hell is Tom Hayden doing in Miami with these students being arrested? <laughs> and who paid for this? And the answer was, Harvard paid for this. <laughs> and they all got out. And the whole purpose of it was to give um, a, a direct account, an eyewitness account, of whatever was about to happen in Miami. And, and, and I, I tried to explain to them, I thought that they would get an enrichment of their educational experience that you could never get in a classroom or by reading a book. And, and it would be the, the nearest that I could possibly introduce them to what it was like in the 1960s. And it was. They came back. They faced a barrage of questions. Why did you do it? What were the ethical uh, 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 questions? And, and, and uh, 
uh, you know, why did you uh, uh, tarnish the name of the uh, institution by being down there? And on and on and on. But they gave uh, quite fantastic eyewitness reports to uh, students. So I have a, a soft spot in my heart for the students of uh, MIT who were there and uh, Harvard who were there. Uh, and they did have an experience quite like the early 60s. And that's what I want to dwell on tonight. Noam talked about the, the, the negative side of 1962. Um, and and I, I, I want you to remember in my comments, I'll try to be extensive, but more, more in, in an outline form. Uh, it, it's hard for anybody here who missed it to conceivably remember the period 1960 to 62. First of all, nobody said, oh, we're in the 60s. <laughs> uh, they had a vague idea <clears throat> that the 50s were supposed to be a period of apathy, when in fact, of course, there was Little Rock, there was the Montgomery School boycott, there was the Beat Generation. There were these precursors to what was about to happen. But it is true that students were not organized uh, did not aspire to uh, power over or even a voice in any decisions at the universities. It was a novel and subversive idea to form a student political party to run for office in student government elections. It was against the rules for those elected student leaders to take positions uh, on the um, civil rights movement in the South to support um, the um, idea of boycotting uh, northern chains like Kresge's and Woolworth's uh, 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 in support of the southern sit-in movement. And uh, uh, we couldn't vote. We could be, uh, guys could be drafted, but uh, nobody could, uh, could vote, of course. So in a very real sense, uh, we, uh, we internalized our powerlessness and described it as apathy. And it, if, it left a kind of yearning or anxiety um, uh, that I think was just looking for an outlet. And these prior events uh, in the Deep South and uh, in San Francisco gave rise uh, in the course of uh, the years to the idea that students should take direct action and should participate in trying to improve society for the better in a very general way to make it more democratic. And I, uh, I, I was a... Uh, uh, student editor at uh, Ann Arbor, University of Michigan, and, and I remember in about 61, uh, I was, they, they were trying to recruit me. Those of you who aren't radicals will appreciate this. I'm talking to you. Uh, you, should, you should make it difficult for them to recruit you. Uh, you should ask a lot of questions. I just wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a storyteller. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I wanted to get away from the Midwest, I suppose. Um, and I, I was not engaged. Um, and I had to cover these stories. And, I, and they kept trying to convince me to join this crazy group, uh, Students for a Democratic Society. And I, I, I thought my mission was, as it is now, to try to observe and tell stories. Um, it hadn't occurred to me that you could be engaged and also be observant in a different way as my MIT students tried to be uh, back in, in Miami, as I described. So I came to the uh, 1960 Democratic Convention covering it. Uh, I wrote a story about the Berkeley student uprising in 1960. I was condemned by the dean of students back in Ann Arbor uh, who called me in and said that my writing was incendiary. If you looked at it today, and you can probably find it online, everything is there. It was really milk toast. It was about as tepid a uh, description, but it was a description of students taking stands, students finding a voice. That's what it was. He said, he said this, Tommy, this leads to uh, uh, Stalin and Hitler. So... I, I should have realized at the moment that the first instinct of any establishment is to overreact. They, they never uh, 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 begin to try to accept your viewpoint uh, and, and ratify it and legitimize it. It's this total overreaction, which of course 
sent me into a, a alienated state and I had the power of ink. I was the editor of the newspaper. So we went after the Dean of Women, we went after the fraternities. It all started with that little overreaction by the administrator. And I, I was invited to go see for myself what the South was like. By the way, I just, I have a 12 year old uh, African American son. I just took him and his mom through uh, Mississippi, Birmingham, Selma, uh, Memphis, we were at the Martin Luther King uh, anniversary of his uh, killing just last week uh, with Jesse Jackson. Uh, uh, G's Bend, where the, the, the elderly people are weaving in a weaver's collective. Uh, uh, we met with an 83-year-old illiterate man who may be the next Picasso named Thornton Dial, whose art is spectacular. So I'm trying now to uh, uh, speed up time so that my son uh, can get an eyewitness sense of, of what this all was about. But at the time, uh, I, I was asked to go to uh, Fayette County, Tennessee, as a student editor, uh, to deliver food to sharecroppers who had been kicked out of their homes for trying to vote. And that's where I met the Southern students in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And that's where I met Southern violence and Southern sheriffs and chains and whips and clubs and uh, lynch mobs. And, and uh, uh, we, we just got out of town driving 100 miles an hour on, on dirt roads. And that was my uh, awakening. And from there, uh, you know, I followed the trail of love uh, and passion into the South. And I lived there for a couple of years. This has background to how I was looking at conditions in 1960, 61, 62. Um, I was in a um, uh, jail after a freedom ride when I was asked by SDS, I was now a field secretary writing about this movement, uh, and, and they asked me to draft a, um, a position paper because they needed a, not a manifesto, but some kind of vision, vision statement you would call it in today's terminology, and, and the vision thing. And, and so I started drafting notes on what the vision should be, and it became this Port Huron statement, this big bulky uh, document that uh, I urge you to read for yourselves. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, it, 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 it found its way out of jail into uh, New York libraries, into campus meetings. It was a very collective endeavor, but the idea was to create, um, uh, and we were all 20 to 22 years old, the idea was to create a vision for our generation because we had this sense, and I think, Noam, it's quite related to the wind that was blowing through the Vatican. There was a spirit in the Kennedy administration and in Vatican II that somehow I won't say it was supernatural or spiritual, but I can't say it was material. I've never been able to pin it down, but I feel that we were vessels or instruments of a feeling that was abroad in the world uh, that did not come from us. I mean, how, after all, could, could I or anyone at age 22 write a $27,000 word founding statement of an organization. It's impossible, but it happened. People read it, they say, well, how did you write this? They say, I don't know how we wrote this. But we drafted it and had a meeting of about 60 people in uh, Ann Arbor, uh, moved over to a camp given to us by the UAW, Nine Auto Workers, and we met there. That's why it's called Port Huron. By the way, I don't think that's good branding if you, you want to use modern terminology because no one has visited Port Huron so they wouldn't want to revisit it, uh, unless you're Michael Moore, who has, who has filmed, he has filmed people there, uh, but no one else I know has visited lately. Um, it, we, we were at Port Huron because the U, UAW had a labor center, a camp, and at the last moment we were very uh, lucky to obtain it, and we met for five days in small groups. We read, digested, argued over, and, and had a, a quasi-religious experience rewriting and ratifying this whole document, which we sent out as a living document uh, to our generation in hopes that it would, uh, it would speak to uh, people of our generation. And I, I, I think this uh, emphasis on 1962 is extremely important 
because on the one hand, uh, uh, I hope that we can be forgiven for our omissions. There was no women's liberation movement. Uh, uh, the, 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 the environmental movement had not materialized. There was a consciousness of nuclear testing and the bomb. The Cuban Missile Crisis was three months later. Uh, the, um, the, the list of things that were around the corner uh, is very long. Uh, but I would argue, and this is the, the I, I think the chief point I want to make, is that the core message that was understood at Port Huron and delivered by our authors uh, was a, a lasting message that is well worth re-examining today uh, for the Occupy movement or for all kinds of single issue movements. I do not believe that, uh, as some do, that it should, there should be a new Port Huron statement. I'm not nostalgic or uh, interested in the resurrection of, of uh, uh, things of that sort. It, it just, I just have this feeling that there comes a time, there are certain moments uh, that manifest in a, an outcry by people like Allen Ginsberg's Howell, uh, an outcry that speaks to everybody else. And it's not an individual act, it's an outcry that somehow um, a few people have the, the good fortune to be able to articulate and pass on. The core message of the document was participatory democracy. Uh, Noam has written uh, on some occasions of the author of this concept, as far as I can search for the authorship, no ideas have single authors, but it seems to be John Dewey. I think so. So John Dewey was actually an elder of the elder organization of SDS before my time, but this was an, uh, an old social democratic institution. And John Dewey's idea was that democracy, uh, voting was not enough, but that participation was essential in all spheres of life. The family was too patriarchal. The workplace was too corporate controlled. Neighborhoods had rights against developers. Foreign policy shouldn't be the domain of remote uh, enclaves of experts. More democracy was good, uh, essentially. Uh, and, and it was, he probably was in the tradition of Henry David Thoreau, who at an earlier time, when there was even less of a franchise, had, had argued, uh, vote not with a mere strip of paper, but with your whole life, meaning uh, put your body on the line as a democratic act, as a participatory act, that the measure of a democracy should be whether it's hollow and token or whether it's robust, fulsome, and, and participatory, and it can be measured. It's a flexible concept. It allows you to be, uh, say, an anarchist for participatory democracy, or a libertarian for participatory democracy, or a feminist for participatory democracy. It, it is a concept that embodies a method and a goal that is more inclusive, I would argue, than other uh, more ideological uh, uh, concepts that people uh, in progressive movements or the left have identified themselves with. But again and again, the resilience of this concept uh, keeps coming back. You see it in the September 17th uh, uh, initial principles of Occupy Wall Street. The first, and the first primary principle is for a direct and transparent participatory democracy. You see it in the students in Tunisia, you see it in the students in Egypt calling for democracy. And, 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 and it's clear that while the meaning of democracy in those places is yet to be fully uh, defined, if it, if it ever is, uh, it, it, it was participatory democracy as both a, a means and an end that it took direct action, it took the occupation of Tahrir Square, uh, it took the full participation of the excluded to begin to move the, the uh, heavy weight of the military dictatorship and the institutions in those countries. So in that sense, uh, it's, it's about direct action, 
It's about voting. It's about protecting voting rights from people who would whittle them away. But it's also about a voice for workers at the factory. It's about a voice for neighbors. It's about a voice for citizens in foreign policy. It's, a vo it's about a voice for students uh, as these de as decisions are made about tuition and the cost of higher education. It, 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 that's the concept. It's a big concept. Not, it, it, it's not definable merely as small groups seeking consensus together, although that too uh, has been part of the tradition from the Quakers to the early uh, sit-ins. Uh, I, I want to uh, say also that it seems to me um, uh, it's alive in the dreamers today. Uh, I, I just finished a class, a a teaching a class at UCLA, and the Dream Act students, I'm sure you have some here, uh, these young people who, th uh, who are here as undocumented uh, residents of our country, uh, have made decisions, as many did in the 60s, to come out of the closet, to come out of their uh, uh, shadows and repression and, and face their fears and face their families and say, I'm an MIT student, I'm a UCLA student, I live in this country, deport me if you must, but recognize who I am. That is the spirit of participatory democracy on an individual uh, and, and group level that I'm talking about when I discuss SNCC and the early SDS. It's alive and it comes alive. And I think it always will because institutions, whatever their purpose, uh, and they can have very good purposes, uh, always become deficient because a politician cannot represent everybody. That's why you have red power, black power, brown power, yellow power, queer power, union power, student power, because everybody wants empowerment of some, some, some kind of self-determination or self-representation in the process. And the only way to get there uh, is through a process that allows people a fair opportunity to participate in the decisions that affect their lives. That's the idea. And I think it will grow beyond belief. You can already see it. And if you're at MIT, MIT you're probably at the, in the vanguard of it. Uh, in, the, in the age of uh, new technology, it should be possible for people to participate in ways that I cannot imagine. I'm not here with utopian thoughts about what the internet uh, uh, permits. Uh, suffice it to say that when we had meetings, we did so by calling people on telephones. That's an obsolete idea. I never use telephones. Um, or by writing them letters saying, I'll see you in Washington at the meeting, handwritten letters on yellow pads with stamps. Uh, so you could actually say, we created a bigger movement without the internet. The 60s was a global movement, there's no question. So it doesn't take the internet to create an interconnected uh, uprising around the world or around your town, but it certainly, in my judgment, does not hurt in the least. It makes so much possible. Uh, interactive participation, downloading of information, the real use of the Freedom of Information Act, uh, referendums. If they can survey you in the detail that they do, as you, if you, you are like microbes to be studied uh, for the purpose of selling you something, whether it's a candidate or a product, uh, that, that same technology can be used to hold pe people with power on a very short leash of accountability. That's all I'm saying. So I think this is a concept that will only grow uh, uh, in, in relevance. I'm not here, in other words, to praise a, uh, a relic, uh, but a resurrect a relic. Uh, it's never really died. Now, one of the... Uh, uh, Elements here. I, I, I need. I, I need to tell you this in the, in a story form, so you you further understand the differences with uh, the the present moment. Um, we occupied lunch counters. We occupied segregated trains. We occupied segregated buses. Yeah, occupations came before us in the 30s. Factories, they'll come after. Uh, the the redwoods were occupied. So occupation as a tactic. Uh, is a way 
that is familiar to partisans uh, on the left or in radical movements and social movements. Uh, and it's a way of making your voice heard, make your presence known, becoming visible, and above all, getting traction, getting leverage uh, by, by, by seizing uh, part of an institution, at least temporarily. The, the, pur the purpose with the sit-ins and the freedom rides, the purpose of the sit-ins was to uh, was to block access to lunch counters and restaurants that segregated in hopes that the repression that came down would cause constitutional problems for the state, image problems in American foreign policy, and above all, a rise of sympathy, empathy, and solidarity from students of our generation, our parents, unions, religious groups, and so on. So it was, it was a tactic that was meant to bring alive a greater participation on all levels in solidarity and support with the, uh, the, uh, the movement. Uh, and this, this, the, the, the idea that I learned from going to Mississippi early and getting my head beat in and, and and covering uh, funerals of people who were killed for trying to vote was there, there was um, uh, an actual plan that uh, historians seem to miss. The, the plan was, uh, you know, not to protest for the moral purpose or the purpose of redeeming the Southern Church or reviving the tradition of nonviolence. The, the purpose was on a group, uh, among a group starting with 15 and it grew to several hundred and then to maybe a little more than that, was to take a blood oath to go into areas of the South and put your body on the line in order to break a system that had held since the obstruction of the ending of Reconstruction in 1876 and the introduction of Jim Crow and terror in the American South. Why do I say that? At the time, we still had the seniority system we do now, but because the Southern whites were very uh, clever and cunning, uh, uh, because they had been on the losing side and were very uh, uh, concerned about preserving what they had, they had utilized seniority to take the chairmanships of all the committees of Congress. Military was Stennis. Eastland was uh, constitutional rights plantation owner, uh, and they, they sat in, con in senatorial and congressional districts typically in which the majority of people or a vast number of people were black people who were not allowed to vote and their exclusion was reinforced by local police. Uh, and that instilled heroism in a few and terrorism in the many and apathy as the outcome until the, the SNCC came along and they made what I would call a generational decision that I heard Obama saying in 2008 over and over, and I think he got this from Bob Moses and some of the early SNCC people, that for each generation, including yours, uh, there, a decision has to be made that's very personal about whether you're willing to settle for what your parents left you, whether that was enough and whether they've 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 set something up for you to inherit that you're satisfied with and can enjoy uh, for, for the rest of your life and maybe your family's life and your friends' lives, or whether it is intolerable, whether it's because your parents didn't fight hard enough or they fought all they could and they just could not push any harder. All these students knew that Jim Crow was their future and that was a kind of death and so they took an oath to die if necessary, try to avoid it, to die if necessary in order to break it. And it was a gamble. The idea of going to try to register somebody weighed heavily on you if you knew that that person could die or you could be killed or you could go back to uh, Boston and leave behind people at the mercy of the Klan. Uh, and uh, a lot of people called this a... Um, you know, a, a martyr's complex, and I suppose it was, but that's only a way to say people had really had all they could take of living this life. 
Uh, without that, nothing, I guarantee you, nothing would have happened. That was the catalyst. And I was very caught up in this because I was a student like many of you, uh, many in the country today, who had general purposes, general ideals, but it had never crossed my mind to put my life at stake for something I believed in. And I didn't know then, and I don't know now, whether I'm willing to do that. The older I get, the luckier I am, the less I'm likely to want to end it before I find out how it turns out. But at the time, uh, this was a very powerful um, emotional bind that people were put in. And uh, you can dismiss it as say it, it, it caused people f to feel guilt and so on, but that's not really it. If you've been around people who, are, who, who believe in something strongly enough that they're willing, if necessary, to die for it, I bet those are people that you would like to be like. Those are people you would fall in love with. That's how it was. SDS was an ancillary of SNCC. SDS was the boycott support organization. I was the pamphleteer. I spoke on campuses. I tried to recruit students to go south. And all my life, I think northern students should always keep going south, whether it's Venezuela or Cuba or Mississippi. The South is the frontier of the battle. I don't know why that is. It's just they go to Nicaragua, they go to all these places, and they come back with a changed view, maybe a Chomskyan view, I don't know, but a changed view of the, the way the world works. Uh, so that's what happened, and that's what we tried to articulate. Now, I, I, I want to argue that we might have been successful Noam spoke of illusions. I think we had illusions, or maybe another way to think of it is the future is unexpected no matter how smart you are. It's just unexpected. Who could imagine then what happened? Uh, so don't ever think that you already know what's going to happen. In, 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 in 62, we thought that through the direct action campaign, we would force the Democratic Party to abandon the Southern racist wing. We would liberalize the, or free the liberals of the Democratic Party. And through a combination of the movement and the institutional liberals, we would affect a majority coalition that could realign American politics, uh, elect a president or hold a president accountable and a congressional majority. We were talking about winning the whole thing and then finding out whether that's where power was or not. We didn't know. If you look at the Port Huron statement, we have a suspicion that there's a higher level above, above the politicians. But we were following John Dewey, which is learn by doing. We didn't start with a theory of where power was. We, we started by uh, direct action to confront power and think that it would be revealed to us what our possibilities were. But it was a very positive expectation alongside the morbidity of the, uh, the, 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 the oath that some might die, but millions could be liberated in this, in this process. It would take this realignment. There was no such thing as uh, uh, rejection of electoral politics, even though we couldn't vote, blacks couldn't be registered because we thought that by direct action, it would be like the Archimedean tool. It would crack open the political system and people would be able to utilize the political system as a result of the direct action. So it was this outside inside strategy, but, and we were the catalytic force, if I can just put it that simply. And uh, I think that, this, that we were on a trajectory towards success. Number one, the, 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 the moment was right for the country to embrace voting rights for blacks in the South. Number two, the farm workers were getting organized in the Southwest. SNCC organizers and SDS organizers were going out where I live. Number three, the peace movement was waking up after the uh, Cuban uh, missile crisis. 
uh, to the, the horrific nature of the uh, nuclear arms race and the Cold War. Uh, Rachel Carson's book just came out talking about the shock of radiation and pesticides. Uh, the women's movement was uh, starting to emerge all in this period, 60, 63, maybe 64. Uh, so everything that we thought was possible was coming true uh, with uh, 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 somewhat to our surprise and shock. We, we were, again, John Dewey is helpful here. We were very experimental and always trying to evaluate what just happened after we came back from an action because we never knew what would exactly happen, but things were happening. What thwarted us was the unexpected, and it came, I think, in three or four forms that we can discuss. Um, and I, I, I don't know if Noam and I agree on this, but I think the murder of John Kennedy was a big factor. We never had a professor who taught the role of assassinations in understanding history. We, we just didn't think of the, the president might be killed uh, for whatever reason, uh, and this, this would be a big problem for our strategy of political realignment, to say the least, if, if there were forces on the loose that would kill the people you elected or kill them as they were changing policy. Kennedy was changing policy from against the March on Washington to for the March on Washington, against uh, doing, he called SNCC sons of bitches because they were so militant and pressing him to supporting voter registration, pumping in uh, foundation money, uh, making a conscious decision in, in hopes that the black South would realign, register and vote Democratic because he was gonna lose one by one the, the white South. All of this was happening uh, and, and the nuclear test ban treaty uh, which was uh, left out, which, which, which uh, happened shortly after Port Huron. Uh, just to put it in context how important Kennedy was to us, we wouldn't have gone uh, to, to take these risks in Mississippi if we thought Kennedy was going to save us. No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying when we finished this document, uh, Al Haber and I drove to Washington and we met with U.S. Senators and we went to the White House to meet with Arthur Schlesinger and had a fine old discussion with him, taking him through the, the points of our document in case his generation of liberals had missed what we had to say. And he, he promised to take it to the president. We said, mission accomplished, let's go back to the barricades. But we had these, there's a strange period here in which all things seem to be possible, and I don't know if that's an illusion, but it's an unusual and rare illusion to experience. Uh, so the, the death of Kennedy, and, and I, by that I mean to encompass all the other assassinations of the 60s, continually decapitated leaders of our country, leaders of movements, in ways that were unpredictable and really prevented, I think, uh, the consolidation of a progressive uh, block in the country. That's one big thing. Two was the, um, uh, the issue of uh, Vietnam. And here we may have a disagreement. I have only read what Noam has to say, but I don't believe Kennedy would have escalated the Vietnam War by sending 500,000 troops, combat troops, to Vietnam. Uh, up the ladder of escalation. I agree with Ellsberg who says he probably would not have. I recognize that this is self-serving and wish fulfilling, but I think it's also true that he would have drawn the line before sending in tens of thousands of combat troops. We'll never know. But the point is, after Kennedy's death, Johnson ran for president on a program of denying seating in Mississippi to the blacks that we organized to come to the convention, and on a promise never to send young American boys to Southeast Asia for combat. While at the same time, the orders for combat, according to Ellsberg, were being written in the National Security Council. So we had never had the experience of presidents being killed, nor the experience of presidents lying to us on simple matters like whether they would draft you and send you into combat. Uh, this was a, a, a totally shocking and disorienting uh, experience. And with Vietnam, 
uh, we had 100,000 uh, troops in 1965, and it went up to 500,000. We had the draft. We had draft resistance. We had uh, the rise of an anti-war movement uh, that became very radical uh, in tactics and in vision. Uh, and it, it was aimed at the liberal failure, the liberal default, because we really couldn't blame the Republicans for starting the Vietnam War. We could blame them for being collaborators or go-alongs. We could uh, agree that Goldwater would have been worse. But nevertheless, it was the Democratic Party that was drafting us, sending us into combat. It was the Democratic Party that was escalating the war with the support of all liberal Democrats in Congress, except for two brave senators. That's the, that, those are the cards we were dealt. We were 24 years old. That was it. So that ended the idea of realigning the country around domestic priorities of racism and, and anti-poverty. At this point, 64, SNCC with thousands of you all were in, was in Mississippi paying the blood debt and also breaking the system in Mississippi. And I was in Newark believing I'd be there for the rest of my life, knocking on doors, organizing poor people for an all-out assault on poverty from Appalachia to Mississippi to Oakland to Los Angeles to Chicago. We had 150 community organizers from SDS working in the North in parallel to the South, not knowing that Vietnam was coming. We had d devoted our lives to this task. And with Vietnam, many of us stayed. The issues remained, but it was clearly impossible to deal with poverty and race domestically in the midst of a war that was escalating. You could feel the life of reforms being sucked out of your lungs. It became a bitter time where you had to take a stand on the draft, on the war, and you had to pay the consequences. And you, you knew you were in for a long, high stakes and bitter battle. So Vietnam derailed the project. A, a side point here, a third point, it, it, it related to this that we never knew um, was the role of the CIA. And I'm not, I'm not into conspiracy theories, but I study them carefully because you never know. <laughs> you just never know. So in 64, Wright Patman is a member of Congress. He holds a hearing on some slightly unrelated subjects. And it, it comes out that the, the CIA has been doing, uh, I mean, in 67, has been doing domestic spying. Domestic, CIA, what is it doing with domestic? And it, it turned out, going back, that they had been very involved uh, uh, for a very long time. This is the reason that we could not shift from the Cold War to domestic priorities, because the CIA operationally funded and ran the International Affairs Department of the AFL-CIO, which we were in coalition with around jobs and civil rights and justice, the 1963 march would not have happened without them. But their international department was helping stop communism around the world in the name of protecting workers. We did not know this. I don't think anybody on the domestic side knew it. They also were running the International Affairs Department of the US National Student Association, which was supporting civil rights in the South, but their international operation was involved in the Cold War. Point, uh, uh, I could go into detail, but the point is, it was, <laughs> it was structurally impossible to realign the country away from the Cold War if the people you were working with were a front for the CIA and didn't know it or didn't tell you. So there was a blockage. There was just a blockage in the system that we didn't learn about for several years later. And that's the reason uh, that the tragedy happened. Ruther, for example, the great uh, UAW leader, uh, who funded SDS, he funded the Economic Research Project, he funded SNCC, he funded the farm workers. Um, he, he was tightly aligned with Johnson and the Democratic Party, and in a turf battle with the rest of the AFL-CIO, uh, his top lieutenant, Millie Jeffrey, was the mother of one of our founders, Sharon Jeffrey. 
Uh, and we saw in 64 that he would not support the civil rights plank. And then in 65, Ruther supported the escalation of the Vietnam War. That was it. He was the last hope for us of the liberals that we had believed in. He, he changed later. Uh, and he, he, did, he died in an uh, accidental death, a tragic death. But by the time he changed, it was all too late. The possibilities had disappeared, basically. The fourth and last uh, reason that we, I think, the project failed is because of sectarianism, uh, ideological sectarianism. I'll be very brief on this. Um, uh, SDS was not a Marxist document, not an anarchist document. Uh, it was an anti-communist document. It was rooted in the participatory democratic populist traditions. It was very homegrown. I think Noam mentioned in his talks about uh, Dewey that Dewey was an unusual American who seemed to be a homegrown radical who wasn't uh, an inheritor particularly of the ideological baggage or traditions of the, of the left, and, and I, I, I always thought of myself that way. And it's not that we were uh, opposed to uh, these traditions. We tried to learn from them, study them, and in, incorporate the, the lessons. In one section of the Port Huron Statement, the collective document, I don't know whose language was, it was, it said, we want to work with both liberals and socialists. The liberals because they're practical and relevant and socialist because they have a long-range critique of the system. But we didn't identify exactly with either. We, it was a more inclusive concept. But long about 67, with the escalation of the war, uh, and the only apparent uh, explanation for the war was imperialism, and all of the theories of the left seemed to be proven on the battlefield of Vietnam, uh, and the Cubans were saying this, and so on, uh, people started to think that the Port Huron statement was too reformist. I was out of the organization by this point, but had I been there, I would have said, yes, that's true. <laughs> it was always reformist. We, the question for us was token reform, substantive reform, radical reform, which? Revolution was an ambiguity. Uh, it was just an ambiguity. If we could get radical reform, uh, that would seem to be uh, the achievement of what the people on the other side of the door were demanding when we knocked on doors and they said, all my life I've wanted to vote. I want to vote before I die, and so on. So it, we were, the Port Huron generation and document were denounced as not radical enough. In fact, reformism was considered uh, 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 not treason or selling out, but closely akin. Like you had to be really out of your mind to be in favor of reform. And, and then what was introduced because of the gravity of the situation and the seeming failure of the American tradition to solve the problem of Vietnam or racism were various forms of uh, Marxism or anarchism uh, that divided into three or four factions that, that uh, fought constantly with each other. Not that they had no substantive critique, but, but it, it was curious that uh, the organization divided into these factions uh, and dissolved itself in 1969 as a triumph by closing the doors of the SDS office in Chicago and throwing away the pig the throwing away the key and announcing we off the pig. This was at a moment when one million people were demonstrating in the moratorium against the Vietnam War. 20 million people were about to demonstrate at the first Earth Day. Kent State was four months around the corner, the largest, and Jackson State, the largest student strike in the history of the United States and the largest there ever will be. Uh, among students as far as, far as I can uh, predict anything. But the, the organization had taken an ideological position that was so far removed from the mainstream of students and, uh, and Americans in general, it was, it was an oddity 
the country was just calling for democratic revolution or reform, and SDS was underground or engaged in, in factional disputes and utterly and totally isolated. Six years after the founding, um, I will dwell on this the rest of my life with remorse and with reflection as well. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm trying to tell you what I think happened uh, to this document. Um, now, one, one last uh, observation or set of observations about Occupy. If you read the uh, Port Huron Statement, you will find, I, I'm Talmudic about this. I know everything in it. I'm searching for who exactly wrote that sentence, so forgive me. But on about page 27, you will find the statement that 1% of Americans control 80% of the wealth. <laughs> so, so I want to say we accomplished much. We left a job behind for the succeeding, for the succeeding generations. Um, the, um, it's a fact. At the time, we said 1% controls 80% of the wealth. And we added, with a little research, that as a matter of fact, it had remained 1%, owning 80%, since the 1920s, despite the New Deal and all of the reforms of the New Deal period. It had never changed. Just like in the 60s, much has changed. We have a black president, much more equality for all kinds of people, much greater access, participation. Uh, you'd get the feeling that on, if measured by diversity, a revolution has occurred. But what if diversity isn't the only measure? What if <clears throat> the question of the uh, ownership and control of wealth is also a measure? And what if it remains the 1%? What has gone wrong? Where are we? Uh, before I try to answer that question, I'm not sure I can. I, I, I promise to be more optimistic than uh, Noam. So I'm going to list for you the things that he mentioned that we accomplished, lest you forget. Because in my theory, when you accomplish something, the other side becomes vociferous because they're the most threatened. Your side declines because they're happy with the achievement. The rest is fought out in the battlefield of memory. The establishment incorporates the reform. It becomes so every day that you can step on and not notice that people risked everything for it, such as the curbs for wheelchairs on the way to this event were achieved by disabled people following the tradition of women and SNCC and SDS taking their wheelchairs and their beaten bodies and sitting in in buildings in Washington until the government was hammered in submission and they passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's a 60s achievement. Voting rights for Southern blacks and 18 to 21 year olds, total of 26 million Americans enfranchised. The end of the Indochina Wars, the end of the compulsory military draft, the fall of two presidents, uh, new at the time congressional checks on the Imperial Presidency, the War Powers Act, the CIA and the FBI, Amnesty for 50,000 draft evaders and war evaders in Canada. Normalized relations with Vietnam. The Freedom of Information Act, 1965. The Media Fairness Doctrine, late 60s. The 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, which would not have happened without the 60s. Toughest environmental reforms in American history, passed and signed by the government and President Nixon. Uh, I might just show you how my little theory works. It's called the Movements and Machiavellians Theory. The Machiavellians take, take advantage and credit for what the movements accomplished. One simple example. It was Nixon that signed all the environmental legislation, stronger, not, not good legislation, but stronger than any legislation signed since. It's because of Earth Day. And Nixon, uh, when, when uh, the, the, the book... Um, um, uh, uh, by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring came out, uh, the real, the Bible of environmentalism in the late 60s and 70s, Nixon wrote the blurb. <laughs> he, 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 he had said in his, in his, you're laughing, you need to laugh, it's got to be funny, this stuff, not, not just morbid. 
He, he, in his State of the Union speech, said words to the effect that it's now or never for the environment. He later said to an interviewer, the environmental issue didn't matter that much to him. <laughs> but he said this. So the, the publishers of the Carson book, Silent Spring, said on the cover, the blurb, it's now or never, President Richard Nixon. That's how it works. So you might not notice your achievements because they're in the hands of others, unless you fight the battle of memory. That's the great battle at the beginning and end of all this. The, the um, public sector employees, like those people battling in Wisconsin, they won those rights in the mid-60s. The first collective bargaining uh, rights for farm workers were won in California uh, by the union started as a result of the early 60s. Uh, the uh, reform of university curriculum, uh, now, like it or not, you can read Noam Chomsky and uh, not get kicked out of school. It used to be you have to go to the coffee shop to read Noam Chomsky. You can say, well, so what? Well, I have to tell you, at least make a list in your mind of achievements, failures, shortcomings. The list is very, very long. And I have a theory that... Uh, Progress moves in stages, and movements uh, are eventually blocked. Uh, they turn on themselves. They come to an end. But they go on. The underlying current goes on like a river. And then uh, uh, people climb on uh, uh, into, the, into the stream, into the current, and start again, always quite by surprise. Uh, but they do. And that's why Occupy Wall Street came. I don't know if it went. But I was really pleased. I was at, uh, briefly at Logan Square. I was at a number of other events. And all I could say is that I didn't expect it coming, and I didn't expect to expect it, because you do, you do not ever expect social movements, except in general. Name one that anyone has ever predicted the night before, the week before, the month before. Uh, it's testimony to the fact that energy is kinetic. It's unpredictable. No matter how smart you are, you cannot comprehend or predict what's about to happen. It's an argument for taking your chances, taking risks, thinking of yourself as a factor that may start something and often may not. But without you, uh, the evidence of history will be missing one possible component. Or rather, you'll be on the shore over here and the stream will be rolling without you. I think that's um, a very important um, thing to realize. I mean, how could anybody in their right mind, you'd have to be not in your right mind, actually, call for a demonstration on September 17th on, on, on Wall Street with the slogan, bring your tents? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? That's what happened. Uh, it was time. Uh, and and um, I think the time, the time has not changed because the Wall Street crisis is still there. The scandal is still there. The politicians are institutionally incapable of engaging in the level of reform that might begin to meet the needs of the people who are suffering, just as was the case in the early 1930s. Um, and the, the police cannot eliminate uh, the, the conditions. Uh, they cannot eliminate the protests. They can only reconfigure the direction that the protests may go. Uh, there, there may be some uh, 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 problems, it seems to me, uh, just, just to name one and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, I've always felt you have to have a, a be visionary and pragmatic at the same time. Uh, and so, um, you need to pick fights that focus the many against the few, where you think you've got a chance, and have a plan of action that starts with your direct action, uh, but hope that the, the fight that you pick will reveal the larger issues that affect uh, everybody. Uh, I don't believe in uniting the few against the many. I believe in uniting the many against the few. So there hasn't been a sustained campaign to attack Wall Street in my lifetime, and a two or three month campaign is not sufficient. Uh, 
I think that, that just as my dean of students back at the university 50 years ago was scared to death when I just wrote a little article about students on the rise, Wall Street is scared to death of this movement. I think that they always overreact. I think that's a tragedy, but, but keep that in mind. It would be a big mistake to think that they're invincible or unchangeable uh, or to think that just a handful of us can't do anything about it. If, if I were Van Jones, and I, I want to clarify that I'm not, <coughs> uh, uh, and I want to clarify that this is only what I think, it's not any, anywhere near what is going to happen. I would go back to Wall Street with a plan, with a three-point set of radical reform demands that are achievable but not easily, um, achievable by local action, federal action. And I would sit in at the biggest bank at Wall Street that would accommodate me, and I would get arrested, and I would try to nail the demands on a tree, and then I would go to jail and I'd say, I want a jury trial. And I would urge my supporters to come with me to jail and stay in jail and demand a trial by jury uh, and fill the jails. And if they force you to get out, go back. How many times, I just come from the trail of Dr. King and my uh, old comrades in SNCC. How many times did they go to jail before the system broke? Each time they went to jail, they had no idea if they were coming back alive. They had no idea. Maybe this movement is too agnostic. They had faith. They had a messianic faith. They believed in the faith that had fortified their forebears. They knew that they were a, a part of something spiritual and larger that, that uh, many other people had come and gone and died for in the past. Somehow, they had this energy to keep going back. You can't imagine what it's like to go back to Birmingham. Oh, my God. Wall Street is a soft touch. The NYPD, they don't match. They don't match the Birmingham police. They don't match Jim Clark or Bull Connor or people that would... Uh, I was interviewing Chuck McDew. He said, you know, these southern white people are crazy. They're... they're uh, uh, they're totally crazy. These are the kind of people, I'm interviewing him two months ago. He said, these are the kind of people that, that if you, you, you get in their way, you pick it in the street like these Wall Street demonstrators, they will run over you with their truck. And then they will back up to run over you to make sure you're dead. And sure enough, as he was giving this statement to me, this interview, that's what they're doing in Mississippi. Do you remember? Not three months ago, there were these crazy teenagers that ran over a black kid, and then they, ran, they backed up into reverse and ran over him again. McDo didn't know this at the time. He just said, that's what these white people do in the South, and this is what you have to be prepared for. So taking on Wall Street, uh, we've failed so far, but maybe it's because we haven't tried hard enough. I have to tell you, the mountain of Wall Street is not higher than the Stone Mountain of Georgia. It is not higher than, than the, uh, the woods uh, and, and uh, tall forests of uh, rural Mississippi. It is not higher than, than, than the Edmund Pettus Bridge in uh, 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 Tennessee. And, and uh, uh, it, it may be what we learned that is the most valuable lesson is that you may be winning while you've experienced the feeling that you're losing. I, I got ahead of my parents' generation. I thought they would never come around. I was completely surprised when they turned against Nixon in the war. I, I thought in my omnipotence that they should have done it 10 years earlier. But I don't get to control human behavior. I can only do what I do, take the stand I stand. I, but I, I, I wish that I had constantly paid more attention to trying to appeal to them instead of turning bitter uh, and feeling that they had let us down, because they did let us down.
That's part of the reason we were motivated. But you really can't win people to your cause if you just repeat that they're letting you down. You have to keep repeating that, that democracy requires them to pay attention, to read the facts, to give it another look. And eventually, uh, somewhat miraculously, in some cases, they'll come around. And if they, if, I would be very surprised if, an, if a majority of Americans would not come around to support rational reform of Wall Street corruption and economic scandal if they saw lots of demonstrators in jail and appealing to the American people. It just seems that something like that may happen. It, it happened with the New Deal. Um, think about that. We think the New Deal was a set of laws that were passed to protect labor unions, establish Social Security, send a lot of intellectuals to interview small farmers in the South, all these great things, as if somebody had that plan. No, Roosevelt was a, a cautious person, a pragmatist. Remind you of anyone? It reminds me of somebody. And, and the left thought he was a sellout, and the right thought he was a communist. Uh, I don't know what his middle name was, Delano, but it wasn't Hussein. But, but, but they kept saying he's, he's, either going, he's a corporate fascist or he's a communist tool. And I think he was a pragmatic politician buffeted by the forces on all sides in the midst of a depression and a coming war. And you could never predict what he was going to do. But uh, people who undertook organizing, community organizing, labor organizing, rural organizing, farm organizing, elderly organizing, healthcare organizing, kept shouting their demands and blocking entranceways and voting for politicians either in office or out of office. And out of this uh, chemistry of confrontation and tumult and contestation and unpredictability came the New Deal as an outcome that no nobody could have predicted at the beginning. That's what I think the future of Occupy looks like. Thanks very much, and I hope that I haven't thank you too long. Thanks. While we're rearranging, I'd like to ask you a favor. Um, I spend most of my, my, day my daytime trying to end these wars. <laughs>